In this video, we're going to continue our conversation regarding hydronics, and we're going to talk about circulator pumps. Now, the circulator is the heart of any hydronic system. Now, we're not talking about heat source. We're not talking about cooling. We are talking about actually the movement of water through the hydronic system. There's a wide variety of circulator pumps available in today's market that allow for greater flexibility and overall system design and control. So all circulator pumps are not created equal. Circulator pumps come in a variety of sizes, designs, and have different performance ranges. In a closed loop, fluid-filled hydronic system, its function is to circulate the fluid or in the system around the piping. No lifting of fluid is needed in this application. Pumps of fractional horsepower are usually used in this application, and they're often called circulators. The pump that is most commonly used in hydronic systems is known as a centrifugal pump, which has rotating component called an impeller. The impeller adds mechanical energy called head to the fluid. As the impeller rotates, fluid within the center opening called the eye is rapidly accelerated through the passageways formed by the impeller veins between the two discs. Okay, so we have the suction, we have the discharge. The fluid comes in through the suction, gets enters the center of the circulator, gets spun around at a high speed and put out through the discharge. The mechanical energy of the fluid is increased as it's accelerated towards the outer edge of the impeller. As the fluid leaves the impeller, the fluid impacts against the inside surface of the chamber surrounding the impeller. The chamber is called the volute. For this process to be continuous, the rate of the fluid entering the pump must be identical to that leaving the pump. We may think that a pump continuously sucks fluid into the eye of its impeller. This is not a true statement. Water entering the centrifugal pump must be pushed in by a system pressure upstream of the inlet port. If proper conditions are not provided for fluid to be pushed into the inlet port, very undesirable operating characteristics will exist. Centrifugal pumps can be built with differently shaped volutes while still maintaining the internal operation. The volute shape determines how the pump will be connected to the system's piping. Again, notice the difference in connections. The inline circulator can be placed into a piping path without the need for lateral offsets between the inlet and discharge ports. The inline circulator is the most common design and used for most residential and light commercial applications. By modifying the shapes of the volute, an end suction pump is created. End suction pumps are usually floor mounted and are commonly used on larger hydronic systems. Again, now we have to have an offset to get to that end. Notice the difference in the mounting. Wet rotor circulators combines the rotor, the shaft, and impeller into a single assembly that is housed in a chamber filled with the system fluid. Could be water, could be glycol, could be anything. The motor of a wet rotor circulator is cooled and lubricated by the system's fluid. The rotor assembly is supported on ceramic or graphite bushings in the rotor can. These bushings contain no oil, but ride on a thin film of the system fluid. The rotor is surrounded by the stator assembly of the motor. So this is an example of a wet rotor circulator. No oiling is required, no leakage of system fluid due to warm pump seals. The smaller size makes it easy for location and support. The absence of a cooling fan and external coupling make them very quiet. Several models are available with multiple speed motors. They're inexpensive due to fewer parts, and they're ideal for applications where limited flow rates and head are required. They can be closed coupled for series pump applications, but they most have PSC motors that operate over a wide speed range. Their disadvantages is that they have a very low starting torque of the PSC motor. It may not be able to free a stuck impeller after a long period of shutdown. Servicing anything not connected to the external junction box requires opening the wetted part of the pump, resulting in fluid loss and air entry into the system. 
In other words, if it's not in the coupling box, you cannot service this circulator pump without opening up the system. Wet rotor circulators are most commonly used in residential and light commercial applications. They are usually available with cast iron volutes for used in closed hydronic systems. Bronze or stainless steel volutes for direct contact with domestic water or other open loop applications are available. The next circulator we need to talk about is a three-piece circulator. The three-piece circulator consists of a pump body, a coupling assembly, and a motor assembly. Unlike the wet rotor circulator, the motor is totally separate from the wetted portion of the pump. This allows for the motor and coupling to be serviced or replaced without opening, having to open the piping system. The design of the coupling assembly varies between manufacturers, but the most common design employs a spring assembly that absorbs vibration or high torque between the two shafts as the motor starts. This is an example of the coupling of the spring coupling used in three-piece circulators. Notice the spring that helps connect it. Springs are prone to damage. Often they'll break and create a ton of vibration and noise. But again, they're easy to replace because you don't have to drain the system to do this. Newer spring style couplings are less prone to damage and help and also help quiet vibrations. These are sort of in line with the shafts. The impeller shaft penetrates the volute through a shaft seal that must limit the leakage of system fluid. So here's a three piece circulator taken apart. You have your motor, you have your bearing assembly, and then you have the impeller and volute. You can service the motor and the connector, this is a spring type connection, and most of the bearing assembly without having to open the system itself and drain um, water or glycol. Some advantage of these is a potential longer life if the bearings are properly lubricated. It's easy to service the motor, and there's a great ability to produce higher starting torque to overcome a stuck impeller. May use a higher efficiency non-PSC motor. Some disadvantages are their heavier construction requiring stronger supports. They have to be oiled occasionally. There's more operating noise due to size and the potential maintenance of the mechanical seals and coupling assemblies. You can also have defective or worn shaft seals which allow leakage. Most circulators are designed to be installed with their shafts in a horizontal position. You don't want to install circulators with their shafts in a vertical position, especially with the circulator at the motor at the bottom portion. The direction of the flow is usually indicated by an arrow that's casted onto the body. The weight of large circulators should not be supported by the system piping. If pipe support is needed, use some sort of vibration absorbing material. So this is an example of a pump mounting for um, the inline or the smaller GF circulators. And this is an example of the pre-made supply and return headers. Notice how it's all put together. And notice how the pumps are staggered as to leave room. If you look closely, you'll see that this one's a little behind this one, but it leaves room for service and access to the electrical. This is a manifold that has actually been made using T's and short pieces of pipe. And again, I just repeat, anytime you have a good quantity of valves, the more valves that you can turn on and off, the better the installation is. A common practice with multiple zone systems is to install several, several circulators on one supply header. The far side of this header should be well supported to prevent it from bending or sagging due to the weight. Unlike fittings and valves, circulators should be mounted so that they can be removed easily for servicing. The usual method of connecting a circulator to piping is with bolted flanges. Pump flanges are available in cast iron for closed loop systems as well as bronze or brass for open loop systems. As the flanges are bolted together, an O-ring or rubber gasket is compressed between the two faces of the flanges to make a good seal. This is an example of a set of standard flanges. 
and these are isolation flanges. The biggest difference is with isolation flanges, I can close the valves on each side of that flange and remove the circulator assembly without having to drain the system. Makes easy, service easier. And this is how it all slips together. Isolation, if isolation flanges are not used, it's recommended that ball valves be installed on either side of the circulator for isolation. It's highly recommended that every circulator installed on a hydronic system be equipped with one of these means of isolation, either using the flanges or the ball valves like you see here. You have your circulator on each side of it, you have ball valves. It's often a good idea to also have a drain valve. Now, we usually try to pump away from the system. In other words, our, our circulator should be mounted on the supply side of the system with the pulling the water out of the boiler and away from the expansion tank. We, to understand why this rule should always be followed, you need to understand the interaction between the circulator and the expansion tank. In a closed loop piping system, the amount of fluid, including that in the expansion tank, is fixed. We are not adding or removing fluid to the system. It doesn't change whether the circulator is on or off. A portion of the expansion tank contains a captive volume of air. The only way to change the pressure of this air is to either push more fluid into the tank to compress the air or to remove fluid from the tank and expand the air. This fluid would have to come from or go to some other location in the system. However, since fluid is not compressible, the amount of fluid is fixed and this cannot happen regardless of whether the circulator is on or off. The expansion tank thus fixes the pressure of the system fluid at its point of attachment to the piping. This is called the point of no pressure change within the system. The point of no pressure change is where the expansion tank connects to the main piping. Now, mechanical energy produced by the pump is called head. A definition of head in a hydronic system is the height to which the pump can lift and maintain a column of water. Now, whenever you buy a circulator pump, okay, we get what's called a pump head okay based on gallons per minute so if we're looking at a taco 007 this is the 007 we know that if we have 15 um gpm gallons per minute we can lift the water using that pump to about um oh let's say it's right over the five so let's say six feet now head pressure in a hydronic system is a little strange, okay? It describes the force that the circulator develops to overcome pressure drop. When we work with closed systems, pump head has nothing to do with the height of the building. Height, as far as a circulator is concerned, doesn't exist. It's a closed loop. So the return has the same pressure as the supply. There's no gravity involved. Pump head only has to do with the circulator's ability to overcome friction. That's because the system is completely filled with water. The circulator doesn't know or care if the building is 100 feet high and 10 feet wide, or 10 feet high and 100 feet wide. All it knows is friction. Pump head has a lot to do with the number of fittings or valves and the size of the building's piping network. It has nothing to do with the gravity or fill pressures of the system. Occasionally, a system requires more head than can be supplied by a single circulator. When two identical circulators are connected in series, the resulting pump curve can be found by doubling the head produced by a single circulator at each flow rate. And this is an example of two circulators that have been connected in series. Circulators in parallel can also be used. This arrangement is used when a high flow rate is required at a modest head. Circulators in parallel double the flow rate. The pump curve for two identical circulators connected in parallel is often obtained by doubling the flow rate of a single circulator at each head value. 
Variable sp speed circulators are available. Variable speed circulators are relatively new to North America, but have been used in Europe for years. The pump curve can vary over a wide range of circulator speeds. And both Tayco, Grundfos, and all the other ones now are making variable speed circulators. One excellent application for a variable speed circulator is a constant pressure circulator. Systems having several independently controlled zone valves are good candidates for this concept. Now, we also have to have flow checks installed. Some circulators will come with integral flow checks. Without flow checks installed in each zone circuit, some of the flow from a separate circuit can be reversed through the circulators that are turned off. Flow checks must be always be installed in each piping circuit any time multiple pumps are installed. Some manufacturers are offering circulator pumps with flow checks in, right in, integrated with them. These integral flow checks consist of a small spring-loaded valve housed within the inlet or outlet of a circulator's volute. And this just shows a circulator with a flow check. If you look real close at the top of this, you see there's a little piece in there blocking that. Okay, it has a spring on it. If the circulator is running, everything will operate normally. If the circulator is not running, it's going to prevent backflow from the other zones. So circulators are used along with zone valves to control the flow of water. You don't always have to have zone valves. You can have multiple circulators. You can have different circulator types. And you can actually go to the variable speed circulators that increases building efficiencies.